Hello, my name is Dave Emery. Welcome to this next segment. In this segment, we're going to continue with our theme of examining right-wing and Nazi terror and infiltration of police and military organizations. We've been taking a look at manifestations of this in all probability in Austria. And now we're going to swing back over to this side of the Atlantic, and we're going to continue with our analysis of the comparison between right-wing terror and uh, the rise of fascism in Europe and in America. As I indicated in my Sons of Gestapo series, it is my belief that uh, some of the incidents of right-wing terror that have manifested themselves in the United States, such as Oklahoma City, the sabotaging of a train in Arizona in October of 1995, and other acts, are being performed by fascist elements uh, that have connections with some elements of the government, however, uh, elements which are by no means coterminous with the government. I will talk about this some more as uh, I get into this particular series. As I've indicated, I believe that the pattern of fascist terror and uh, the onset of fascism in Europe is comparable to and directly connected to the rise of fascist terror and the onset of fascism in the United States. I believe that in the United States today, there is a program of fascist subversion which in some ways compares with the subversion of the Weimar Republic from within by elements sworn to uphold it, but in fact opposed to it. I think that in certain respects, the disintegration of America into fascism, and it is my opinion that that is what is going on, also bears some comparisons with the disintegration of French democracy prior to World War II, fascist subversion in France, as I have indicated in one of my archive shows called Why Johnny Can't Identify Il Duce, fascist subversion in France helped to weaken France for the Nazi conquest in 1940. The fascist infiltration of and subversion of France was in fact aided and abetted by fascist Germany and Italy well before World War II. I will detail these comparisons as we get on with this particular series. We're going to begin uh, this series known as Specialized, entitled, I should say, Specialized Knowledge and Abilities, by rereading a very important segment of an article in the British Searchlight magazine. The Searchlight is a British anti-fascist publication. More about the Searchlight and how to subscribe to that right now. To subscribe to the Searchlight, a British anti-fascist publication, write to Searchlight Magazine Limited, 37B, New Cavendish Street, London, W1M8JR, or phone 011-4471-284-4040, or fax 011-4471-284-4410. That's the Searchlight Magazine Limited, 37B, New Cavendish Street, London, W1M8JR, phone 011-4471-284-4040, or fax at 011-4471-284-4410. That again for information about how to subscribe to the Searchlight magazine. In the Searchlight issue of November of 1995, there's an important article by a German anti-fascist, uh, Andreas Foss, F-A-H-S is his last name. It's entitled, Werewolf or Paper Tiger? The State of Germany's Nazi Movement. This article talks about some of the organizational structure that German fascism has taken in the wake of a highly publicized series of right-wing terror attacks uh, in the early 1990s following a German reunification that resulted in an ostensible crackdown, at least on some of the more flagrant Nazi activities and groups, although they appear to be uh, coddled by elements sympathetic to them from within the government. By the way, a pattern that I think applies accurately to activities going on in the United States as well. In this particular article, Andreas Foss talks about the tactic adopted by German Nazi groups following this crackdown in response to this wave of terror, and specifically describes a tactic of attempting to form small autonomous cells to act in concert but independently of one another. This is very similar to a strategy that we're going to be examining in connection with American white supremacists and their proposals to infiltrate the militias and to carry on uh, programs of right-wing terror. Uh, that particular strategy is called leaderless resistance, and it was crafted, or at least named, it's actually a relatively old tactic, but it was named, and I guess one could say almost copyrighted, by one of the seminal 
white supremacist in the United States, former Ku Klux Klan leader Louis Beam. More about leaderless resistance later on in this series. However, I want to note for the present circumstances the similarity between the tactic that the German fascist groups are pursuing and Louis Beam's leaderless resistance. Again, I'm suggesting not only a parallel structure and operational mode for German, Austrian, European, and American fascism, but also ongoing and significant operational connections between those. More uh, later on. Reading now from Werewolf or Paper Tiger. Speaking of the crackdown on the German Nazi movements, or at least ostensible crackdown, the author writes, One aspect of this was the early reaction to the bands, namely to form so-called, quote, autonomous nationalist groups, unquote, following a left-wing model. From the outset, the attempts to establish such autonomous cells were organized on a conspiratorial basis, held together with a very tightly organized cadre structure, and led according to the principle of, quote, obeying orders from the leadership, unquote. And again, we'll compare this with Lewis Beam's leaderless resistance tactic later on. Skipping down on this article, we're going to reread a section which in many ways will key this particular series, again called Specialized Knowledge and Abilities. This concerns the tactics that have been advocated by Stefan Hupka, H-U-P-K-A, one of the most important German so-called neo-Nazi leaders and the head of an organization called the SRA, which stands for Social, Revolu- Re- Social Revolutionary Workers Front. What Hupka and his SRA are advocating is that in order to formally overthrow democracy, in this case in Germany, the Nazi groups should infiltrate the police and military in order to use the specialized knowledge and abilities that they acquire thereby to overthrow democracy. Hence the title of this series, and it'll be a long one, Specialized Knowledge and Abilities. This segment of Werewolf or Paper Tiger reads... In Umbruck, U-M-B-R-U-C-H, the SRA's education bulletin for leaders, sub-leaders, and trusted activists, Stefan Hupka, a central SRA cadre, sets out clearly the dual strategy of the SRA involving infiltration of the state apparatus. Quote, Known activists must get on with their normal political work, which is as necessary as ever. The others, however, should keep their distance from known rightist groups. They should not even identify themselves as nationalists. They should join the army and the police, and see to it that they acquire specialized knowledge and abilities, unquote. The acquisition of this, quote, specialized knowledge and abilities, unquote, denotes the preparation of a new level of terror aimed not principally at foreigners and asylum seekers' hostels, but at, quote, politicians, journalists, intellectuals, and various organizations who prove themselves stubbornly anti-national and pro-multicultural, unquote. What is set out here is essentially the, quote, strategy of tension, unquote, that has already begun in Austria with a series of Nazi letter bombings. Rieger, that's Jürgen Rieger, Rieger, a uh, top German Nazi lawyer, Rieger pointed in this direction as early as 1992 when, in an interview with ARD television, he proclaimed, quote, when the first reporter is knocked over, when the first judge is rubbed out, then you will know it started, unquote. The political foundation for the NF organized werewolf organization is precisely this, quote, strategy of tension, unquote, according to which the bourgeois democratic state will be made to look weak and ineffective in the face of terror, coupled with the development of political and economic crises. It is a fact that this kind of strategy does lead towards the establishment of a, quote, strong state, unquote, whose attacks on democratic rights and increasingly repressive policies can be attributed to the need to react to such terror. I would note, uh, by the way, in this context, looking ahead to uh, the subsequent uh, subsequent segments in this series, the draconian and anti-civil liberties counter-terror bill, which is currently on the front legislative burner in the United States and which has gained a certain amount of momentum in the wake of Oklahoma City, uh, should be noted in this particular regard. I've gone into the strategy of tension and Operation Gladio, an outgrowth of a NATO contingency plan to set up guerrilla groups to harass the Red Army in earlier segments available from Archives on Audio, about which I will have more to say later in the program. Continuing with this segment, the German Nazi terror onslaught of 1991 through 93, for example, enabled Helmut Kohl to toy publicly with the idea of introducing a state of emergency which would have led to the curtailment of democratic rights. Similarly, the Austrian Nazi letter bomb campaigns have served above all to strengthen the electoral fascist Jürg Haider and his freedom movement and have made their demands for the beefing up of the state apparatus and for increased spying on the population by the state a matter of public consensus. Ideologically, 
the Gemeinschaft, and above all the SRA, which is based in East Germany, hark back to the fascist national revolutionary tradition during the pre-Hitler Weimar Republic with its mixture of radical nationalism and anti-capitalist, anti-system sloganeering. By the way, this particular uh, form of fascism, uh, also known as national Bolshevism, uh, and again, something that uh, I think can be ac- accurately compared from the Weimar period in Germany to the contemporary period in America and elsewhere, uh, this particular tactic or this particular ideological bent is quite similar to uh, much of the ideology of the various militia groups in the United States, uh, themselves a mixed bag, but uh, elements of which I think uh, correspond quite closely to the national Bolshevist or national revolutionary tradition of uh, pre-Hitler Weimar fascism. Continuing, this form of anti-capitalism is utterly reactionary and focuses on only certain aspects of capitalist development, such as monopolization, internationalization, and the role of finance capital. These aspects they link frequently, but not always, with anti-Semitic propaganda about, quote, Jewish capital, unquote. From the standpoint of the Nazis, in a situation of increased social crisis and a future economic crisis, the objective and subjective conditions for broadly based nationalist and racist, quote, social protest from the right, unquote, are well and truly imaginable. Again, I agree with this author's uh, analysis, Andreas Foss's analysis, and I think it applies not only to Germany and Austria and elsewhere in Europe, but I think it applies in a big, big way to what is going on in the United States. With uh, the aftermath of Oklahoma City leaving more questions than answers, but certainly with the two accused and the one individual who is going to be bearing witness against them, the accused being Timothy McVeigh and Terry Nichols, the individual who will be bearing witness against them, uh, Michael Fortier, all having been members of the same military unit within the U.S. military, I think that it is high time for Americans to ask themselves to what extent uh, Nazi groups in this country also have been infiltrating the military and police in order to acquire specialized knowledge and abilities. We should note that uh, fascism is not something alien to the United States and that many of its most powerful institutions, from its corporations to its intelligence services to the military proper, have had more than a passing dalliance with fascism in the past, as we have seen in uh, discussions available from archives on audio dealing with American corporate support for fascism and also for the incorpor- with the incorporation of much of the Third Reich's national security establishment into our own at the end of World War II. We're going to turn our attention next to a very disturbing incident which may be indicative of a larger pattern of white supremacist and Nazi activity within uh, the elements of the armed forces and or police. Reading now from the Los Angeles Times of Saturday, December 9th of 1995, we're going to read an article or a section of an article by Eric Harrison of the L.A. Times. This is Datelined Atlanta and headlined, Three White Soldiers Charged in Killing of Two Blacks, subheaded, One says slayings were racially motivated. Another claims intent was to harass drug dealers and prostitutes, police say. Suspects are from Fort Bragg. Skipping down. Whatever their intention, when the hunt was over, by the way, this deals with uh, two active-duty U.S. soldiers with the 82nd Airborne Division who murdered two black people in cold blood on the streets of Fayetteville, North Carolina, simply because they were black and possibly, as we shall see, possibly to celebrate the anniversary of the death of Robert J. Matthews, leader of a neo-Nazi terrorist group called The Order. Continuing. Whatever their intention, when the hunt was over early Thursday, two black people were dead in Fayetteville, North Carolina, shot without provocation by white soldiers from Fort Bragg, according to authorities. The two Army privates were charged Friday with first-degree murder. A third soldier was charged with conspiracy to commit felony first-degree murder. Police, who found Nazi and white supremacist materials in a room rented by one suspect, said that the shootings were a racial hate crime the victims chosen at random. Quote, They were just two innocent people walking down the street, unquote, said Lieutenant Richard Bryant of the Fayetteville Police Department. Killed were Michael James, 36, and Jackie Burden, 27, who were both shot in the head at close range. When police searched a trailer where 20-year-old Private James Norman Burmeister II, B-U-R-M-E-I-S-T-E-R, rented a room, they found a 9mm semi-automatic pistol that they they believe is the murder weapon. They also found a virtual gallery of neo-Nazi and white supremacist paraphernalia and a video that depicts random murder. Quote, we found among his belongings copies of Resistance magazine and The Rise and Fall of the Third Reich and a videotape Natural Born Killers, Bryant said. Police also found a Nazi flag and many other German banners. One wall was covered with German flags, Bryant added. 
The other suspects charged Friday were 21-year-old Private Malcolm Wright and Sergeant Randy Lee Meadows, Jr., also 21. All three suspects are with the 82nd Airborne Division. Burmeister and Wright were charged with murder. A spokesman for the Southern Poverty Law Center, an Alabama-based civil rights organization, alleged Friday that Fort Bragg is a hotbed of white supremacist activity and noted Thursday was the anniversary of the death of Robert J. Matthews, leader of a neo-Nazi terrorist group who was killed in a 1984 shootout with FBI agents in Washington state. So whether uh, the anniversary of the death of Robert J. Matthews cued this particular act, or whether perhaps they were simply uh, attempting to move up within the white supremacist organization that they were apparently affiliated with, remains a matter of speculation. However, we should note that in the wake of this particular crime, a spider web tattoo that was worn by one of the accused may very well have been a symbol of having killed for the white supremacist cause. Turning out of the New York Times of Friday, December 15th of 1995, we find an article, datelined Fayetteville, North Carolina, and, headline, and uh, headlined, Is Spiderweb Tattoo Mark of Racial Killer in Carolina? Question mark. And it's by Kevin Sack, S-A-C-K. The article reads in part, Shortly before a black couple were killed on a Fayetteville street last week, a Fort Bragg soldier with white supremacist leanings spoke of wanting to, quote, earn his spiderweb tattoo, unquote, by committing a murder, according to an affidavit filed by the police. Law enforcement authorities said experts on extremist groups said today that the spiderweb emblem has, on occasion, been used in skinhead and gang circles to designate its wearer as a killer, sometimes in racially motivated crimes. But the police said today that they had no evidence that the tattoo was a badge of membership bestowed by an organized group of racists or extremists. And tattoo artists and the experts on underground groups cautioned that the spiderweb tattoo has taken on various meanings over the years, including but not restricted to the commission of a murder. Still, the police noted that one of the two soldiers charged with a double homicide last week already had a spiderweb tattoo on his elbow. A local tattoo artist, Terry R. Corliss of Bill Clayton's Tattoo World, said he inked the $150 design on Private Malcolm Wright Jr. months ago. It was Mr. Wright's only tattoo, he said. He didn't really talk about it too much, unquote, Mr. Corliss said, again quoting. He came in on a Saturday morning and said he wanted a spiderweb tattoo on the elbow. The only thing he insisted on was putting some sort of symbol in the middle, a circle with a cross. Uh, I have not seen uh, Mr. Wright's tattoo. However, that uh, sounds like a description of the uh, circle cross, which is a modified swastika symbol uh, worn by Ku Klux Klan units and uh, other elements of the white supremacist movement. Skipping down in the article... Speaking of an affidavit that was uh, written in support of a request for a search warrant, we read, in the document, Fayetteville Police Investigator Christopher Corzioni describes his interviews with Mr. Meadows, who police believe was driving his army friends around that night but was not, present, was, was not present for the murders. Quote, he stated he was aware that Jim Burmeister had his father's 9mm Ruger pistol with him when he left the car, unquote, Mr. Corzioni wrote. Throughout the evening, Jim was talking about wanting to earn his spiderweb tattoo, which he explained means which he explained means killing a human. Unquote. Police Lieutenant Richard E. Bryant said that law enforcement authorities had interviewed skinheads and white supremacists in the area and concluded that quote it was a symbol or a sign that you had killed for the cause, that cause being whatever their beliefs are. Unquote. Lieutenant Bryant said that Mr. Burmeister's other comments, as related by Mr. Meadows, quote would pretty much tell us that his cause was racially motivated, unquote. Again, uh, this incident has raised the question about the extent to which uh, people of extremist, fascist, white supremacist, what have you, beliefs are infiltrating the army, and I would also suggest the possibility that they are infiltrating police units in order to acquire this specialized knowledge and abilities. More about uh, not only the possible significance of the spiderweb tattoo, but also white supremacist activity in and around Fort Bragg, comes from the Los Angeles Times of Sunday, actually the San Francisco Sunday Examiner and Chronicle, of Sunday, December 17th of 1995. This article originally from the Los Angeles Times. It's datelined Fayetteville, also. It's by Eric Harrison, and it's headlined, Killings Reveal Hints of Web of Racism in Military Ranks. Subheaded, Authorities' claims that slayings were isolated event are met with skepticism. Skipping down in this article, we read, On Wright, this is uh, Malcolm Wright, and uh, one of the accused, the other is Randy Lee Meadows, the Mr. Meadows you heard alluded to earlier. On Wright's left arm, police saw a tattoo of a spiderweb, the racist badge of honor Burmeister reportedly had been intent on earning. 
Police say that the tattoo signifies the wearer has killed for the Nazi cause, but have no evidence linking Wright to any other murder. Army officials acknowledge that, in hindsight, it looks as if there was ample reason to suspect Burmeister had racial problems that needed attention, although they stress that many people are only now coming forward with allegations of skinhead activity. But if superiors did not recognize that Burmeister was a powder keg, how many others are there in the Army just like him? Quote, We are actively investigating right now, but we really feel that this is an isolated incident, unquote, Johnson said. He said a report would be issued on Monday detailing the installation's findings. But some are questioning whether the base leadership tried strenuously enough to stop the infiltration of racist hate groups and whether the Army is taking the necessary steps to protect the public from rogue soldiers. For James Florence, president of the Fayetteville chapter of the NAACP and a retired Fort Bragg tank soldier, the answer is no. Quote, it's out of control, unquote, he said. He noted and police confirmed that within the past two months, live anti-tank rounds were found away from the base within Fayetteville. Florence asked, quote, the concern is, how can a military person get this, have it off post, and have it downtown, and nobody knew anything about it? How did it come about that nobody missed it, unquote? Indeed, I think a worthwhile question to ask. Uh, still more about the suspicions of some local citizens that the type of activity that uh, led to this uh, killing is more widespread than the Army uh, wishes to officially acknowledge were contained in an article from the San Francisco Examiner of Monday, December 11th of 1995. This is an AP story, Dateline Fayetteville headlined, Army and FBI on Hunt for Racists, subheaded, Fort Bragg under investigation after soldiers allegedly kill black couple. And uh, skipping down, we read, The Washington Post reported Monday that according to human rights activists, racist activity has been widespread at Fort Bragg for some time, and Burmeister and Wright were part of a, quote, subterranean culture of white supremacist skinheads, unquote. Quote, there is a large skinhead presence in this town because of the types of people stationed at Fort Bragg, unquote. Bob Sminter, S-M-Y-N-T-E-R, owner of Purgatory, a bar popular with skinheads and other white supremacists, told the Post, quote, This is not a normal town, unquote. Well, indeed, uh, I do not myself know just how widespread uh, Nazi and white supremacist infiltration of the military and possibly police is, and how many of them are deliberately in these organizations to acquire, quote, specialized knowledge and abilities, but I think it's a question well worth asking. I would also note, although it may not be relevant, that the current chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff is an Army General John Shalakashvili, who himself is the son of a Georgian Waffen-SS officer whose writings at the Hoover Institute in Stanford laud the uh, Waffen-SS. I would also note that Shalakashvili's father's unit fought against uh, allied fought against American units at Omaha Beach on D-Day. We're going to continue with this analysis in subsequent series. Those of you who would like to follow up on this type of research uh, should take advantage of a type of radio documentary that I've put together over the years called The Archive Shows. These documentaries consist of printed documentation read on the air, much uh, as you have heard this evening, and the programs have been taped and are on file as an audio study resource. They're available from a tape duplication service called Archives on Audio. More about that right now. All of Dave Emery's archive shows are available from a tape duplication service named Archives on Audio. They can be contacted at P.O. Box 170023, San Francisco, zip code 94117-0023. The phone number is 415-346-1840. Again, Archives on Audio can be reached at P.O. Box 170. 170- 0023 San Francisco 94117-0023 The phone number 415-346-1840 There is also a catalog available which lists all of the archive shows gives a synoptic description of each show and cross-references the programs with other broadcasts containing similar or related material The archives on audio catalog is available on the KFJC webpage, which is reached at http colon slash slash www.cygnus dot com slash kfjc slash emery. Again, the website, all lowercase letters, is http colon slash slash www.cygnus.com 
slash KFJC slash Emory. The website also has a suggested reading list and a list of other sources to pursue for more information on this field of research. Neither Dave Emery nor KFJC gets money from this arrangement. Also, those of you who would like to pursue book titles should get in contact with Antifa Book Service. More about that right now. You can contact the Antifa Book Service at 945 Terravel Street, number 117, San Francisco, California, 94116. They specialize in books about fascism, the intelligence community, and clandestine power politics. Neither Dave Emery nor KFJC gets money from this arrangement. Again, that's A-N-T-I-F-A Book Service, located at 945 Terravel Street, number 117, San Francisco, California, 94116. And that concludes this particular segment. My name's Dave Emery. Thanks for listening.